All right, so let's make a formal introduction for our listeners. Good afternoon, Stephen. Uh, my name is Claudio, and I'm calling you from Washington, D.C., from the studios in Fairfax City. We are very humble and grateful that Stephen uh, Gustafson accepted our invitation to our show. Hey, Stephen, welcome to the show, man. Hi, Claudio. Thank you for having me. No, quite the, the opposite. It's a pleasure for me. So let, let's start a little bit of what's going on in the world, not in terms of politics. I don't, I don't want to talk about Russia and Ukraine because it was crazy. But with the COVID, you know, with the COVID, we have got the COVID for the last two years. So if you're a touring musician, you can tour. You know, uh, if you, some in some profession, you were affected and it had been crazy. And then little by little, you know, more gigs are happening. Bands, many bands disappear because they couldn't pay the bills. They're doing something different yeah. for a living. And, and, uh, and some bands stayed. And uh, so we am very lucky that at least here in DC, we're able to see more show how how the COVID has affected you, your your family, your sanity. How are you holding up, man? Um, I welcomed it. Yeah. Um, I um, you know we travel for a living, and uh, I'll, I'll be sixty five years old in April tenth, and uh, you know we've been doing it for forty years, and um, while I I enjoy playing. Um, for people and and just playing the guitar, playing the instruments, um, making music. Um, I don't particularly like traveling much anymore. Uh, um, it's nice to go to new places that we haven't been. And there are certainly, uh, you know, we'd love to get back to the UK and Europe uh, should the opportunity arise. But um, I'm a homebody. I like being at home, and I have uh, I own 70 acres of land, and I built my house there in uh, in 1993, um, uh, and I like being there and in, in the woods and at home. And um, in 20 in October of um, 2020, my daughter, our our youngest child, uh, got married at our house. So. I spent that entire summer, you know, it was an outdoor wedding. So I did a lot of, I cut trees down and, uh, and, you know, made more lawn and I worked on the house and we redid some of the wood floors and, uh, you know, did some painting and just getting ready to host guests. And, um, uh, I, I was very happy doing that. Um, and I, I actually almost reached a point, um, where I thought I didn't want to go out and play music anymore, where I was very happy just to be home and be retired and play golf and go skiing and, you know, and see my children. Um, but, you know, we, I think we had some unfinished business as far as the band goes. And one, we, we, it was very difficult for us to write new music you know, when we're on the road a lot, we, we don't do that very well. We have to be focused in our studio. Um, so what the pandemic did was it gave us that time to do that. Um, and while some of our band members live in Buffalo, New York, um, the band's hometown is Jamestown, New York, about 70 miles south of Buffalo. So it's sometimes it's not always easy getting, you know, all six band members together to, to work. But we, we did that and we recorded about 24 basic tracks, demos for new material, new songs. And so we're slowly um, working on those when we have enough, we have time when we can, um, you know, take our gear out of the truck and set it up in our studio and uh, do basic tracks, do overdubs. You know, we haven't started the mixing process yet or but it's coming. It's a slow process. And at first I was a little frustrated about that, that it was just taking so long, but it is what it is. And um, uh, then in June of 2021, we had some outdoor shows, which was, um, it was good to get back and play in front of people again, because, you know, ultimately I think what musicians like more than anything is applause, right? Is applause. And, um, you know, it, there's really, it's a, it's a very unique feeling to have a room full of people 
stand up and yell and scream, you know, in joy. And, and, and they're, they just feel so good and they're dancing and laughing and singing and the feeling that that <clears throat> creates in a room full of 500 people um, is just, it's, it's stimulating, you know, it makes your adrenaline, you know, flood your body and all the endorphins and it, it's a real, it's a drug, um, and, you know, we like that. And in September, we did a few more outdoor shows. And then in October, November of 2021, we did a little tour uh, sort of along the East Coast. I think that's where I saw you at the Birchmere. That's right. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, and, you know, the, the, the six band members, you know, we all love each other. We're all friends. Mm. Um, we're friends with our crew. Some of our crew are family. My son works for us. Our keyboard player Dennis Drew, his son works for us, you know. So it's it's a really tight knit group of people, and we all enjoy our time together on the road. Um, uh, you know, being successful at the end of the after all the work the crew does to set up the gear and and to you know and that well the time to travel there and then doing sound check and then finally you get to do the show and when we know we we feel like we've played well. And the audience responds to that, um, you know, it's, that's successful to us. Yeah. And I enjoy, I enjoy meeting our fans, you know, uh, we've got really good fans and they're really kind people. Um, uh, and I enjoy talking with them and that. <clears throat> so, you know, I, 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 it, the pandemic didn't bother me at all. I kept my sanity. Um, I got vaccinated, uh, I got COVID, <laughs> um, uh, but which wasn't very bad, but, um, uh, you know, we're kind of glad we're sort of happy that there's seems to be a light at the end of the tunnel, you know, and we're finally um, fine. Yeah. booking, yeah, booking more shows and uh, getting back to the Birchmere again. And, yeah. you know, which is one of the great, one of the great venues in the country. We love playing there. Yeah. Yeah. And the people that go there, as we talked before, and uh, um, they, they really love you guys in the area. I mean, since I'm in the border with Maryland and, uh, and Washington DC, every every band, every literally every band, come this way. You know, people here in Washington have a high, you know, disposable income that can see a lot of shows like myself, and uh, they like music in this area. So every every band, big bands, small band, starting people that are starting up there, they do very well here, and uh, they're very receptive to music and. You guys do very well. I mean, uh, you know, it's different. You know, over the years from '80s until now, some people in the band have come and gone and come back and you know retire, whatever. But the the sound is still there. Mary is an excellent singer as well, and you can you can play here, man. You know, for the next hundred years, you know. <laughs> well, you know, um, Washington area, the D.C. area, and Richmond and were when we first, you know, we started in Jamestown and then it was, it was sort of um, the next big step was playing in Buffalo, New York. And then um, we had some friends <clears throat> who lived in Atlanta, Georgia, and they said, you know, you should come down to Atlanta and uh, you can get a lot of gigs, live here. So we bought a small old 1979 Dodge Tradesman school bus and um, packed all our gear in it and moved to Atlanta, rented a house um, in 19, must have been the, the 19, early 1983, I think. And we slept in the floor, we didn't have any furniture and we didn't get many gigs. <clears throat> But we met, you know, we met a few people um, that would help us later on in our career. But the first place we played outside of our hometown, our area was um, Richmond, Virginia, where we had friends there and they booked us a gig. We went and slept in the floors of their apartments and we made more friends there and we, and we went back and played more. And, um, and then we... Um, we finally found an agent and he got us in the, in the old 930 club in Washington, DC. And we played there many times. And 
for the longest time, Washington uh, was our most played city. Um, we played there a lot, and we've played in practically every venue in Washington, D.C. over the 40 years from, you know, the, that small, dingy 930 club um, and to um, uh, George, you know, the big, oh, I can't remember, even remember the names of the places, but... Yeah, Brown's Head, you play, and the, the Bishop Memory Time. And, yeah. Well, and, and, and bigger, you know, bigger venues. We played big auditoriums, and we played the, uh, the shed there um, outside of D.C., the uh, outdoor... Um, the summer stage thing. So we've played there a lot. And I think that's, you know, helped build our audience. And that's why I think we have a lot of success still, you know, playing that area. Mm. I got you, got you. So where are you, let's go back to the beginning. Were you born like in a musical family? How old were you when you began, I don't know, taking piano lesson or guitar lesson, whatever what, what the beginning is? Well, I'd say, <clears throat> Um, you know, my parents loved music. They always they always had music on, uh, big bands, Patsy Cline. Um, uh, you know, my dad liked to sing, you know, when he'd have music on. And he played piano a little bit, although we didn't have a piano in our house. Um, when we saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan in 64, yeah. I think that's when I first thought, Oh, that that looks like fun. I want to do that. And that was six years old. Um, when and my at the time we were living in my dad was in the Air Force and we were stationed in uh, Omaha, Nebraska. He was at SAC headquarters in Omaha, and he retired and he retired in '64, right not long after we saw the Beatles. And we moved back. They moved back home to Jamestown, New York, and uh, he had um, a guitar that was his father's a 1930 Gibson tenor guitar that he actually used to just hang on the wall of his, you know, I guess you'd call it a man cave. It, they had a bar in the basement of the house where they'd entertain friends and stuff. And it was just, you know, it was just a decoration. And when we moved, it, it, it got put in the attic and I was just rooting around up there one day and I saw it, I opened it up and I thought, um, I'm going to learn how to play this. So I bought a, you know, a lesson book and I taught myself how to play guitar chords. And then I'd buy, you know, musical books from, you know, bands I liked when I was sort of a teenager um, and learn those. And the, the kids, the boys across the street from me, um, they played guitar. And uh, so we, our first, first band I was in was, was with those guys. And we played at the nursing home up at the top of our street for the uh, old residents there, or we'd play at the playground for our, you know, for our friends or on the porch. And we were called Jim and the Jokers because that was, Jim was the name of the, of the other guy. Yeah. And um, mostly sort of old sort of church songs, Michael rode the boat ashore and, uh, you know, old Stewball was a racehorse. And, um, uh, and then in, um, in the sixth grade, um, the junior high school came to our elementary school. The junior high school band came and they were recruiting um, students, kids to take up, and pick up an instrument, and learn how to play it to play in the junior high band. And you invited your parents. We went and we saw the performance. And um, my dad said, OK, I'll buy you any instrument you want as long as it's not a drum or a violin. So I picked trumpet because the conductor played trumpet. So I, I did that for three years and took lessons. And during that time, I would take guitar lessons off and on. <clears throat> um, and um, when I got to uh, high school, I sort of switched to theater because there were that's where most of the girls were. And I was interested in talking to the girls. You know, I was afraid, but I thought that would give me an opportunity to at least say hello and. So I did some acting and singing and musicals and stuff. Um, uh, and just, I'd met in, in high school, I met in 1973, I met Dennis Drew. He lived on the north side of our town and I grew up on the west side. He was an athlete, you know, and I was in this theater and we became friends over a discussion of, you know, what, who was your favorite band? And his was Bob Dylan and mine was Neil Young. And he said, oh, I play piano. And I said, oh, I play guitar. So I would take the bus across town to his house on weekends and um, with my guitar. 
And we'd sit in his living room and he'd play the piano and we'd do Bob Dylan songs and Neil Young songs and, uh, and kind of dream about being in a band, you wow. know, how fun that would be. Um, and then in, uh, in college at Jamestown Community College, they had a, uh, they were just starting a 10 watt non-commercial FM radio station. And we thought that'd be kind of fun, you know, let's, let's do that. So um, we, we, you know, we were sort of in the ground floor of that. And so we, Dennis was sort of the general manager and I was the m music programmer. And mostly we were just DJs and smoking pot in the parking lot and um, just having fun. And um, that's where we met some of the other members of the band uh, one day. I was doing a radio shift on a Saturday afternoon or something, and a, and a young girl, young woman walks walks in and says, hey, I, you know, I like your radio station. Would you play some of my records? And I said, sure, come on in. I said, and she said she was going to, she was joining the uh, the college radio station in the fall, or the, the college, going to school in the fall. And I said, well, you should, you know, join the club. You know, the radio station was a club. And she said, yeah, okay. So she gave her a DJ shift, and, you know, and we just, sit around and talk about music and that was Natalie Merchant and um, one and another radio shift I got a phone call from a guy who worked worked down the road at a factory and it was Rob Buck and he, he we started talking about music he said oh I love that gang of four song you played I think they're really great and I said yeah yeah I do too and he said well I've got this band we're not really good and we're sort of this avant-garde punk band and you know we're looking for places to play, so we booked him a gig at what we called Wednesday Night Coffee House, and it was just mostly just having fun. There, there, there weren't many students that would come, and we were just having fun. And uh, his band was breaking up, and he said, "You know, you want to join the band?" I said, "Yeah, I, I play guitar." And he said, "Well, we need a bass player." And I said, "Well, that can't be too hard, can it? It's only got four strings. I could figure it out." <clears throat> so we actually. Rob and his, and his friend, they, they held auditions. <clears throat> and I, I went to the audition with a, uh, I brought a bottle of wild turkey with me. I don't know why. And I drank most of it and uh, passed out. And he thought that was just perfect. So I, got, I passed the audition. And um, we rented a, um, a little 12 by 12 foot room in an abandoned warehouse that these guys had set up to sort of artist cooperative where people would paint and musicians would rehearse and stuff. So um, Dennis played piano. So we invited him down and a friend of ours played drums and he came in and I, I said to Natalie, well, you know, why don't you come and hang out? You know, it's fun. We're just, we smoke pot and play music. And she said, okay. And her mother would come down and drag her home and tell her to stay away from us. Cause we were evil, evil boys. And, uh, she just started sort of singing. She would start screaming and singing into the microphone. And we, and we weren't very good, so we just wrote our own songs, you know, uh, as best we could. And um, about six weeks later, we got a gig at a bar in Erie, Erie Pennsylvania. And uh, it's a long story, and I won't bore everyone with all the details, but we, the, uh, the bar owner threw us out, uh, chased us out the door. Uh, because of a small altercation. We got paid $50, and um, we just thought that was the coolest thing ever to happen. And so it, from that point on, it was just sort of, we just kept trying. We played in uh, the local resource center um, where disabled or, and, or ch physically or mentally challenged adults would, you know, have jobs and stuff, and we would we play in their group homes. Um, you know, we played... Um, you know, anywhere we could. Um, and then we, we met John Lombardo, uh, or the rhythm guitarist. He, he was actually a bass player in another band in town, and we'd go see them. And um, we, we became friends. And John, like you, he, he had a record collection of about three, 4,000 albums. And he was sort of the, um, you know, the, the go-to guy if you wanted to know who played, you know, guitar on what record or who produced this record. And because he had, he just loved it like you. He, he listened to music constantly. So he was the elder statesman of music in our town. And his band was sort of breaking up after the summer and we joined together and 
that's when we became 10,000 Maniacs in, in the fall of 1983. We played our first show, uh, Labor Day weekend in Jamestown, New York. Yeah, and, and then after, huh? And here we are 40 years later. <laughs> yeah, and then how difficult, I mean, I think the first album was released in 93, uh, Secret of the Ice Sheen. Uh, how difficult was for playing the first gig until trying to get like a record deal with a you know record label? How, how difficult was the first, especially the first year or two, right? So, well, we, um, we just thought that was the, the best way forward was writing our own music. And yeah. the, um, <clears throat> the university up the road, Fredonia State University, had a program for tone meisters, audio engineers. So um, we thought maybe we could record something there. So we put a poster up in the student union in the common room and said, you know, we're an original band uh, or a band that writes original music. And, if, and one of the students called and we, we became their senior project for their, um, for their thesis, you know, to get their uh, uh, master's degree for audio engineering or maybe it was bachelor's degree. And um, we had to record mid from midnight till eight o'clock in the morning because that's the only time was available. And uh, I, you know, we recorded in a hurry. Um, uh, we didn't have much time, you know, because it was the end of the school year. It was actually Human Conflict Number no. Five was the first uh, record we we recorded, uh, five songs. <clears throat> And then uh, the next year we did the same thing with and we recorded Secrets of the I Ching. And so what we did was we we borrowed money from our parents and our friends, um, uh, kind of like the early versions of of uh, of, of um, crowdsourcing to you know yeah. to pay for it. And um, we sent looking in in records and in magazines, you know, Rolling Stone and Musician Magazine, we just look for influential names and find addresses and we sent those people records. And one of them was uh, John Peel, who was the, the great uh, DJ of BBC One in London. Um, and he, he just played the coolest music, although we didn't know except, you know, this was 83, there's no internet, you know, there were no cell phones. It was um, kind of like the Stone Ages, if you think about it. Um, but we sent him Secrets of the I Ching, and he played the song My Mother of the War on his radio show. And he wrote us, he wrote us a letter uh, and, uh, and said that he, how, how much he liked the song and that he got, it got good response from his listeners. And in 1983, the year end poll from his listeners, we out of, they called it his nifty 50, his 50 favorite artists of that year, we were 23. Wow. So um, that was sort of an opening for us. And in, we found an agent. The agent got us into uh, um, better clubs in, in bigger cities in New York. And in, I think in March of um, 84, we met, um, uh, we met a couple of Englishmen who were at, at our gig at Danceteria. One was an um, uh, artist, uh, a &R representative for a record company, and the other was a gentleman who managed bands. And um, the, the manager guy said, you know, Howard Thompson was here. He's, he, I think he liked you guys. You should contact him. Here's his number. And um, so we contacted Howard, and he said, yeah, you know, let me think about it. So Peter Leake, the other Englishman, who he became our manager, and he had this idea. He said, all right, we're going to go play in London. We're going to get you three gigs, um, and it's going to get you some press. And we played in Brixton at the Fridge. We played in, at Dingwalls in um, Camden Town. And we played at the famous Marquee Club in London. And it did. It got us press. The British press wrote about it because they were very good about, you know, covering music in the British press. They just loved it, right? And, and of course, Britain had a national radio station. They had the BBC, unlike America, where it's just so big. You know, it's, there wasn't really a national radio station until MTV came along. But 
because of those gigs and the press that we got, it, um, you know, we got some more attention from other people. And uh, Howard Thompson signed us to Elector Records in uh, the fall of 1984. And then he said, you got two months to write 20 more songs because we got to go record uh, in February. So, <laughs> wow. oh, oh, no. no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Oh, yeah, no pressure. Um, so we did that. We went and we actually went to London to record the record with Joe Boyd, who worked with early Pink Floyd. Joe produced early stuff um, um, with them. He did some Fairport Convention because we were sort of fans of that music. Uh, and he was a great guy. He helped us a lot. And that's where he recorded um, The Wishing Chair in London. We lived there for five or six months. It was glorious. We had, it was just great. So much fun. You know, we got turned on to curry, you know, and so we ate it constantly. <laughs> it was it was great fun. Yeah, I, I love going to London. It's, uh, it's very expensive, but it's a great, yeah. it's a great city, man. It's crazy to live there, man. It's so pricey, but yeah, so many great venues. We haven't been there in a while, and we really want to get back. And, of course, I think when, you know, when we were there, it wasn't nearly as expensive. And, of course you know all our stuff was paid for so <laughs> it didn't matter <laughs> good for you man so what about, then a couple of years after you guys did uh in my tribe right so that's what you got i think uh one hit went to <clears throat> i mean the album went to number 37 so that was a big big deal right i mean you were getting noticed um here at least in europe and here in the united states as well right so yeah um the the wishing chair the, the record company didn't recoup their money for that but we were, we didn't spend a lot on it and and back then um you know record companies were still interested in developing acts they, and they they would give bands a second chance and they did with us but they said you know we've got you've got to use a uh, you know a bigger name producer and so they picked peter asher and uh, Peter wanted to record out in Los Angeles. So, so we went out there in uh, 86 and, um, or 87, I, I forget which, what year or anything is. And uh, Peter taught us a lot. Uh, he taught us really about playing in tune and in time and um, getting hooks and songs. And one day we were in the studio uh, just goofing around while they were fixing something. And Rob Buck started playing the riff to Cat Stevens' Peace Train. Yeah. So we all just jumped in and we were just, just goofing around. You know, and Natalie started singing, Ride on the Peace Train. Peter Asher ran in the room and said, What's that? What's that? And we said, uh, It's Peace Train by Cat Stevens. He said, Oh, play it again. So we played it again. He said, Okay, we're going to record that. And we weren't particularly happy about that because, you know, we wanted to record our stuff. Our own stuff. He, yeah. said, no, we, he said, You know, we got, we got to do this. We got to do this. So so we recorded it, and Peter made it his, you know, his his personal uh, 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 mission to make that song a hit, and it it started getting us radio airplay, um, and more attention, and the record got, you know, we always got very good um, reviews in in music reviews and magazines. The press and the writers really liked us a lot, um, for the most part. <clears throat> Because we were unique, you know, we didn't sound like anybody else. Um, and then the um, the success of that of that radio play helped get us on late night television. Um, our first uh, was actually it was the Johnny Carson show back then, and on Friday nights Jay Leno would be the host, and that's when they'd have pop music, you know. Uh, so we got that. And that, that got us on David Letterman. And then that eventually got us on more radio stations and, and eventually on Saturday, Saturday Night Live. And then, you know, that crazy thing called MTV happened. And, you know, that played a big role for us, too. Yeah, man, good for you. So you were making, at the time, making enough money to, I suppose, to, well, more than enough to survive in music and, uh, and, and kind of the rest of history, right? So... Uh, yeah, yeah, we were, you know, we could, we could afford a nicer used car. Um, 
I got married in 87 and my wife and I, um, you know, we, I was making enough money.